This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman as we turn to Syria. Earlier today, Syria's Prime Minister Riyad Hijab said the Syrian regime is collapsing morally, financially and militarily, his comments coming a week after he defected to Jordan. Meanwhile, on Monday, United Nations observers in Syria blamed both government forces and the armed opposition for the increasing civilian death toll in Syria. The escalating conflict has magnified the refugee crisis both internally and in neighboring countries. More than 4,000 people entered Turkey in recent days, bringing the total number of Syrian refugees there to close to 60,000. There are tens of thousands of Syrian refugees in neighboring Lebanon as well. To talk more about the situation in Syria, we're joined by Omar Dahi, assistant professor of economics at Hampshire College, born and raised in Syria, just returned from a research trip to Lebanon, looking at the consequences of the Syrian uprising, including the impact on refugees. And still with us from Cairo, Democracy Now! Correspondent Sharif Abdel-Kadus. His article on his recent trip to Syria was published in The Nation on Monday. It's called On the Ground in Zabadani, a Syrian town in revolt. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Sharif, let us begin with you, with this trip you just took to Syria. Tell us about the town you were in and what happened. Well, Amy, I spent a few days uh, in a town called Zabadani, which is uh, about 20 miles northwest of Damascus, just across from the Lebanese border. Uh, it's a town of 40,000, really a picturesque place that uh, is known for as being a, a resort town for vacationers in Syria and for the Persian Gulf, uh, known for its striking scenery and, uh, and fruits and fresh water. Uh, and has really been transformed 17 months after the Syrian revolution began into uh, a city under siege. Uh, there is, uh, the, the town is nestled in the bowl of a valley, and uh, on the mountains above, uh, the Syrian army has stationed tanks and artillery guns and shell uh, the town uh, every day, uh, either day or night, uh, with indiscriminate violence from afar. Uh, really what, what uh, took place, and why I spent a lot of time with the Free Syrian Army, uh, fighters in Zabadani uh, is, is emblematic or a microcosm of what happened uh, in Syria as a whole. Uh, you know, characteristic, characteristic of this revolution uh, that began in the, in the countryside, uh, the, uh, Zabadani uh, started its uprising two weeks after the revolution began in Dira uh, on March 15, 2011. These were uh, overwhelmingly peaceful protests, nonviolent protests, people taking to the square uh, to calling for change. Uh, and the response by the regime was uh, similar to what happened in the rest of Syria, a crackdown by the security forces, violence against demonstrators, widespread uh, detentions and raids on neighborhoods. Uh, on May 27th, a uh, 26-year-old man named Hussein Slicha was shot in the stomach and died. He was their first revolutionary martyr. Uh, in Zabadani. And uh, th since then, the uh, protests grew despite the violence, uh, but the death toll continued to climb. And by August or September of 2011, young uh, men uh, in Zabadani began to arm themselves uh, to protect demonstrations. And there was an increasing rate of militarization of, uh, of the uh, revolution. Uh, their, their ranks swelled with defectors from the Free Syrian Army who were from Zabadani, who defected with their weapons and returned to Zabadani. I'm sorry, defectors from uh, the, the, our, the regime's army. Uh, who uh, defected with their weapons to Zabadani. And so uh, uh, they, they fought under the banner of the Free Syrian Army, but really this was a catch-all term for anyone who was uh, fighting against the regime. There was no coordination with other groups uh, at, first, uh, uh, at first or with any uh, leadership in southern Turkey. Uh, so this, the, this battle really culminated in a major offensive by the regime on the town in January. Uh, where they sought to uh, really bombard the town. Uh, the rebels mounted a very fierce defense, uh, destroyed a couple of tanks, and actually forced the Syrian regime into a ceasefire. It marked the first time in the Syrian uprising that the army was forced to uh, abandon a major offensive. Uh, some point to the fact that there were Arab League observers uh, deployed in Syria at the time who may have pressured the regime to back down. Nevertheless, many of the residents speak very proudly of when they quote-unquote liberated the city. Uh, but this uh, was a brief respite. It, it took uh, three weeks before the regime returned with a massive bombardment of the, of the city, uh, forcing the, 
rebels to surrender on February 11th. As it stands right now is there's checkpoints, a few checkpoints within the city. Uh, the uh, army soldiers don't leave those checkpoints and the city is pretty much controlled mostly by its residents, by the uh, free Syrian army. However, the regime has taken, as I mentioned before, to shelling uh, the residents from afar. Uh, so uh, day and night you hear these booms, uh, they, they hit residential buildings, uh, people are killed. Uh, and uh, this is the kind of life uh, that, that's lived there. And, and uh, as in much of Syria, the town has seen massive internal displacement. Uh, nearly all of the residents of one side of the town, which is uh, the most targeted side, have moved uh, to the other side of town or have left Syria completely crossing the border into Lebanon. Where are they getting uh, their so, weapons from, so, Sharif? Um, uh, well, the uh, weapons are coming through a smuggling route from Lebanon, uh, carried by young supporters. Uh, they're, they're poorly armed, uh, these uh, rebels in Zabadani, uh, mostly assault rifles and some RPGs. The kind of uh, arming and funding and support that we've seen from the Gulf, from countries like Saudi Arabia and Qatar, that has really ramped up in the last three months and has channeled mostly uh, in the north from southern Turkey uh, to places like Aleppo, they haven't seen this kind of support uh, coming in. So uh, they're poorly equipped and they have uh, taken to not attacking uh, military checkpoints, realizing that they cannot militarily vanquish uh, the regime. So they're in the stalemate and uh, under constant shelling. And why did you choose uh, to go to Zabadani? Well, uh, I, I found a way in uh, to Syria. As we know, the Syrian government uh, is, does not really allow journalists uh, in on official visas, or, or very rarely does. Uh, and so there was a way in uh, through Lebanon uh, to reach this town. I was hoping to reach Damascus, but uh, the, uh, the number of checkpoints around Damascus prevented that from happening. Uh, but, but really, it was a very uh, interesting and eye-opening experience to uh, see this town, uh, which has, uh, is basically waiting for some kind of solution uh, to happen and is yet uh, really on the, on the receiving end uh, of uh, the majority of the violence. Sharif, I want to thank you for being with us and your bravery in um, just describing in the nation piece, especially at the end, as uh, uh, you're interviewing people and the shells are falling. Democracy Now! correspondent uh, Sharif Abdelkadu speaking to us from Cairo, from where he has—where uh, he's just returned from Syria. Um,